Thank you for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we pray big prayers to a big God and we expect big results. If you have any questions or you want to find out about who we are, visit us online at victory.church or download our mobile app. Now let's check out today's message. Christmas family, I hope you're doing okay. Victory Church family, how's everyone doing today? Uh, Merry Christmas to you. We're so thankful that you're here. Merry Christmas to those of you who are watching online today. We welcome you. Uh, we're excited that you're taking time out of your day to join us, whether you're in your pajamas or dressed up in the living room, wherever you're at, we thank you. Edmond Campus, we love you. It's such a joy to, to meet you right where you are. Uh, we're excited to continue this series that we're in called The King is Coming, and it's an Advent series. If you've missed any of these weeks, I highly encourage you to go back and watch them on our app or on the website. You can go back and watch those uh, anyway in that direction. Uh, but we've been talking about these four themes of Advent. Week one, we talked about hope. Week two, we talked about peace. Week three, we talked about joy. Do you still have joy from last week? Everyone smile. Let me see your big smiles. Let me see your teeth. Let me see your teeth. I'm not stopping until I see everyone's teeth. Okay. Uh, all right. We still have joy. We're taking that with us. Uh, today I want to talk about a topic to conclude this, uh, the topic of love. And really, um, I'm probably the mo most excited, I was, I was the most nervous, but I, I've already got one under my belt, so I'm the most excited uh, to preach on this topic. I'll tell you why, because love is, is something that, um, uh, it's, it's, you already kind of know what I'm going to say, right? I mean, you've heard sermons on love, and you know the word love, and you know what the word love means, and what what that calculates in your mind, even right now as I'm saying it. And so it's hard to write a sermon on love because it, when, I, when you even say I'm preaching a sermon on love, I was like, uh, I've heard this one before. And so I really wrestled with this one because there's different directions I could go. I could talk about, you know, love your neighbor uh, and how we should all do that. And everyone's like, yeah, we know, John. Uh, I could talk about the Greek word for love. You know, there's several Greek words for love, agape and philo and all these different um, love, but I'm not going to do that either. Um, There's a lot of things I could talk about with love, but I really decided that I would talk about the simplicity, the simplest form of love, but also the most complex. Love is one of those things where um, even children can understand love. The simplest mind can understand that God loves them, but it's also such a complexity that the most brilliant minds on the planet uh, the most brilliant theologians try their best to express the love of God on a page, and they struggle to do so. And you'll find that if you really dive into the subject of God's love that he has for us, that yes, it's very simple, but it's also an endless dig, because you can never truly reach the depths of our limited understanding as humans. And so I didn't know where to take this, but I'm just going to take it to the simplest form of, of that I know where to take it. And so I'm going to preach on a passage of Scripture that honestly, as I looked back through all of my notes, I've never preached a sermon on this passage of scripture. And I'm almost embarrassed to say that because it's a verse that we all know, even if you're not a believer, even if you've just grown up uh, around America, you've probably seen this on a coffee mug or on a poster somewhere. And it's really a verse that many of us know by heart. I've preached with it in my sermon, but never as the foundational verse. And it's simply John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is, this is that passage. So I'm not going to preach to you today about how you should love each other, because you should. I'm not going to tell you what the Greek word is for love and all of those things. Most of you already know that. I'm not going to preach to you about how you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, which you should. The scriptures say that. I'm going to simply talk to you on the subject of Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I'm convinced that if we can really embrace this thought, as simple as it is, with all of its complexities, if we can truly understand this thought, that really locked inside this idea of receiving God's love is where hope resides, it's where peace resides, and it's where joy resides. So 
perhaps all three of these subjects of hope, peace, and joy all lay within this subject of love. Let's pray. We'll we'll jump into this. Lord, we thank you for today. Uh, We thank you for your love. God, would you give me the ability some way to express uh, in my humanity and the limitation of my words what your love truly looks like and what it means for us as believers and how it should transform our life. We thank you for it. Thank you for what this season represents, God. Jesus really is the reason for this season, and so we focus our attention on that. We move our affections and our minds and our attention away from the things that come to distract us, and we pull our full attention into your word today to encourage us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I heard, um, not too long ago, I heard Pastor Robert Morris say, he was asking somebody a question, and he said, what do you think the theme of the Bible is? Just use one word. You can always use one word. What's the theme of the Bible? And this person said, well, love. And he said, well, that's a nice guess, but it's not, that's not the right answer. Love is the subject, right? Love love is the character of the Bible because God is love. It says that in the scriptures. We'll read that in just a little bit. God is love. He said, I would present to you that the theme of, of the Bible in one word is give. Give. Everything has been given to us. We are children of God and your salvation has been given to you. It's a gift. Um, uh, He gave, God gave his only son. It was a gift. The the Holy Spirit was given. uh, The gifts of the Spirit in Galatians, it says that they're gifts, they're they're given to us. And so this love, I want to talk about this love that God has freely given to us today. And if you'll just kind of Take away all your preconceived ideas. Take away where you think I'm going to take the message. Take away, I've heard this before, and just really focus into what I feel like the Lord wants to say today uh, as we accept this love. And so I'm going to do something very unoriginal. As I prepared for this message, um, I really couldn't get out of my mind the sermon that I preached on peace. Uh, If you remember the three points of, of the scriptures of peace was you take it, Right? Remember, you, you take it, you keep it, you let it. Take it, keep it, let it. And so in an effort to be really, really unoriginal, I'm going to use the same three points to express to you the love that God wants us to take and keep and let. And so if the first thing, if you're taking notes, write this down, guess what it's going to be? Take it. Look at your neighbor and say, take it. Take it. Let me show you this passage of scripture in John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. It was a gift. Give. He gave it. It was something that he wanted us to take. And then the, and then John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, watch this. It says, What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. You can, you can hear the author. He's like marveling at this thing called God's love. He's saying, just look at it. We're children of God. That's who we really are. We're not what the world says. We're not what our insecurities say. We're not what our, our thoughts say. We're who God says we are. And God says, you are my beloved. I love you. No matter what the world comes to say, he comes to say that his love is for us. This word extended in the Greek, in some translations, it says bestowed. It means this, to reach out to deliver, to commission, and to let one have. It's like when you call Grubhub or Uber Eats, they're going to deliver it to your doorstep and they extend it to you and they say, here it is, take it. This is, this is what the Lord does with, with, with love. He comes to extend it to us. And what I want to try to begin to unpack is, um, I don't think I'm saying anything so far that's really all that profound. But what I want to try to get you to learn is that at the core of who you are, at the core of all of your mistakes and your failures and your hang-ups and your issues, if you'll boil it down and peel every, of the, every layer of the onion back to the core of who we are, many times, I would, I would say most times, it comes back to our inability to receive God's love. And when we cannot receive God's love, we then have the inability to love ourselves and if you can't love yourself, you sure can't love anybody else. And so I want to boil this down. So three reasons you should take it. First reason you should take it is you can't earn it. You can't earn it. It's not something that you could earn. Um, it's not something that, that you can do all the right things or say all the right things to begin to allow God to say, God's like, yeah, now I love you more. It's, it, that's not how God's love works. So remember, we talked about last week that you're a trust fund baby. Remember? 
We talked about this. You're a trust fund baby, and God has entrusted something to us. And you were born, I hate to break it to you, no matter what kind of money you make on this earth, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth called God's love. And you're a trust fund baby. And it has all been given to you. It has all been set aside in a trust. (laughs) That's something that we get to partake in, something that has been entrusted to us. Uh, uh, Eddie Shearer, he comes to the church here. He told me last week, I, I used this illustration of the trust. Remember when we talked about trust and joy and God has set aside this thing in a trust called joy that we get to partake in. And I love what he told me after service. He said, he said you know, this idea of a trust fund, that, that God is the only one who set up the trust, sent his son to die, and then Jesus actually died and came back to be the executor of his own trust right? So he came back to, to be the executor or to execute the trust to say, my peace I give to you, my joy I give to you, my love I give to you. This is something that we all get to partake in. So you can't earn something because it was given to you before you even knew you existed. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says that before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. He's like, before you even knew that you were a human, you were just this little fetus, right? You were alive, you were breathing, you were, you were a human being. That's why abortion is wrong. You were a human being. But he says, before you even knew that you were a human being, I loved you. You can't earn it. You can't earn it. Because it was given to you before you even knew that it was available. The second reason is he loved you first. God loved you first. Uh, in, in 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. He did it first. You can't love him first because he already loves you. He loved you before you knew what love was. The love that you're able to give to people around you is simply because it's an overflow of the love that he has already given to you. It's like when you go um, to a restaurant with another couple and that dreaded moment comes, you've enjoyed the meal, everything's been great, and then the waiter or waitress comes up and says, this really powerful statement that makes the whole atmosphere change awkward moment one check or two and you're like uh weird moment like you you know if you want to know the trick you pause a minute you're like let the awkwardness sit just let it sit you know the other person I'll, I'll take no no really my favorite though is whenever that waiter or wait, waiter comes waitress comes and hands the check and is handing their credit card back to them, which, tell, which then you know that during the meal at some point, they got up, they weren't going to the restroom, they went to the waiter and they said, this is on me, put it on this card. This is that idea that God loved us first. You can't earn it. This person went and got the check without you even knowing it. Before you even had a chance to pay the tab, they already paid the tab. You just take it. You receive it. You receive the blessing. And God is like this. He, he loved us before we even knew what love was. The third reason we, can't, uh, we, should, we, should, we should take love is he loves you in spite of you. This is the best news of all. That he loves me even when I'm an idiot. <laughs> even when I'm unlovable. Even when I do the things I shouldn't do. He loves me in spite of me. And if all of these things are true, if he loves me in spite of me, if, if I can't earn it, then I should just take it. Just take it. On your worst day, still take it. When you've done something horrible, when, you do, when you've done something that you can't even imagine you would ever have done, you've made the biggest mistake of your life, you hurt people, you harmed yourself, his love is still there for you to take. You just take it. Look at your neighbor and say, take it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his, demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you in spite of you. Even while you were a sinner, he didn't wait for you to clean up your act. This is because God does not do love, he is love. Yeah. Love is not an act that God performs on you. He is love. It's not a, God is not a verb, it's a noun. It's something that he is. It is not something you can make him do or make him not do. That would be your ability to manipulate God's love. You cannot manipulate God's love because God is love. 
and he loves us, so you should take it. Second thing you should do, I know this is a shocker, but you should keep it. You keep it. It's something that you took the time to receive. You should, you should keep it. Do you know it's, it's really easy to, to get married? It's harder to keep married, right? It's just harder. It's really easy to spend money. It's harder to keep it. It's really hard to keep money. It's even easy to take love, but it's harder to keep it. And I'm, I'm convinced that I, I don't even think the enemy, I'm going to say something kind of strong here, I don't think the devil even cares if you take God's love. It's more important, the more important question is, can you keep it? Uh, Jace, my son, come up here, Jace. Dad, will you come with him? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you guys in an illustration here. Some of you saw him walk in with a basketball, and you're like, man, this dude loves basketball. He's bringing a basketball to church. Um, he does love basketball, but that's not why he brought a basketball to church. He is wearing a Thunder shirt, though, I'll just say, Oscar. Uh, so, <laughs> so, okay, so Jace is going to be representative of a child of God, okay, because he is. My dad, now, Dad, don't get your head big on this, but he's, my dad's going to represent God. Yeah. Don't get a big head, okay? Um, I'm going to represent the devil, okay? Your pastor is the devil for the next few moments. I want to illustrate this. Me is the devil. I'm not sure that the devil is too concerned with God giving this ball, which would represent God's love. I don't, yeah, that's a good illustration too. The devil, the devil can't take it away. Okay, so he's not too concerned with God giving his love to his son. Go ahead and give that. So he is now past son. That, and, and what did Jace do? He took it. He took it. But what the enemy comes to do is he comes to take it. And he's got quick reflexes. The devil can take your joy and take your peace and take your hope real quick. He's good at it. All it takes is a phone call. All it takes is one, one no reply. Somebody, can you believe that they didn't even reply to my text? Can you believe that? It doesn't take much. And the devil will come to rob you real quick. So he just wants to know if you can keep it. And, and, so, and then what does God do? Because he's infinite, he is love, he gives him more love. And then the devil comes to say, nope, it's mine. You don't get to keep that. You don't, you don't get to do that. So what does God do again and again? Because God is not a God of first chances or third chances or fourth chances. He is a God of infinite chances. He loves, his love is never failing, it's never ending. So he gives it to Jace again. Then the devil comes in and what is it? Whoa, snap, okay. You've been working. You know I can still beat you though, right? Okay. All right. Th thanks, guys. You guys can go. Good job, Jace. And if you'll note, if you've lived long enough, you've noticed that one day you'll be happy, the next day you'll be depressed. And somebody will even ask you, what's wrong? And you're like, I don't even know. Nothing happened, no issue, no... What happens is the enemy comes to rob you. He comes to take something away from you. So what's maybe more important than taking God's love is keeping it. Keep it. We, we got to protect it with everything in us. Do not allow the enemy to come and make you think that you're disposable. Because this is, why do we feel like we lose God's love? We live in a disposable world. Think about this, okay? Diapers are disposable. Um, cameras are disposable. Everything is disposable. You throw away everything. And it's even become so, it's such a disposed culture, a disposable culture, that if your 50-inch LED TV breaks down, if you go to a repairman, if there even is a thing, is there is such a thing as a TV repairman anymore? You go to them, they're going to say, well, sir, actually, it'd be cheaper for you to buy one than to fix it. Just, just throw it away. It's a culture where everything has become disposable. Nothing is repaired, nothing is restored, nothing is redeemed. Uh, my wife has this little KitchenAid mixer, you know, the KitchenAid mixers, all the ladies have one. Whether they use it or not, it looks good. It makes you look like you're a baker. It's great. And so she, she has one, and the other day it started shaking. She had turned it on, and it was like, blah, 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 you know. And I'm like, babe, just throw it away. I'll get you another one. Like, I'm, what are the words coming out of my mouth? And my wife was like, What? She goes, go get a flathead screwdriver. So I obey because she's, you know, the boss. So I go get a flathead screwdriver, I come back, and she's like, just tighten this screw right here. You tighten the screw and no more wobbling, right? 
But the enemy has even injected our culture into our spirituality where we now think that when we wobble, when something is out of whack, when we're not thinking properly, acting properly, doing properly, that now we are disposable. And we even believe the lie in and of ourselves that I'm not worthy, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not good enough. We in and of ourselves come into an agreement with the lie that the enemy has told us and we now become disposable. All, that, all those things, you can break all that down psychologically, you can break all that down, but if you really wanna boil it down to what it is, you stopped taking and keeping the love of God. Living for one existence and one existence only because God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross to redeem you, to restore you, to tighten the loose screws, to redeem you, that you're not disposable, that you're not insignificant, that there is a purpose for you on this life, and all of this comes out of this redemptive story. We see this happening in Paul. So Paul, in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul has this really authentic, transparent moment where he I love Romans chapter 7. If you ever struggle in your humanity, read Romans chapter 7. Because Paul is like just confessing. He's like, the things I do want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. He's, and then he concludes and says, what a wretched man am I. This is Paul. Paul. If Paul's a wretched man, I don't even know what word to describe to use me, right? But then he says this in chapter 8. Verse chapter 8, he says, no, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now watch what he's convinced of. For I am convinced, that's a strong word, that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, neither present nor future nor powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He understood. He, he came, he boiled it all down and came to this conclusion. I have to accept the love of God at the core of who I am. If I don't get that right, I'll never love myself. I'll never love others. I'll never have be able to do anything, have relationship, have marriage, have a good, good picture of money. Everything in my life boils down to this one truth. John 15 verse 9 says it this way. It says, Jesus' words. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. It's like, you want to know the secret to life? Stay in my love. Keep it. Keep it. Take it. Keep it. Don't let anything rip it from you. Don't let any issue, any relationship, any situation rip that out of your, out of your hands. This word remain in the Greek means this. Not to depart not to become different in reference, now watch this last part, in reference to time. Now this particular Greek word doesn't just talk about what you should do, remain, but it also brings in an element of time. And it's saying, this is not something that you do today and then kind of like, yep, I'm gonna remain in God. And then a week later you're like, oh yeah, I forgot, my bad. It's perpetual, that on an ongoing basis, why? Because you're human. You're not that tough. You're not that strong. So I need to stay in the one who is strong. I need to remain in his love in order to keep it. Now, let me ask you this question. What are, what are things that you keep? Now, I'm not talking to the hoarders in the room. We'll talk to you later, okay? There's, there's help for you. I'm not talking about hoarders because you keep everything. But everybody else, what is it that you keep? You keep things that are valuable to you. Now, how many of you in your house somewhere, you can take me to it, it's in the attic, it's in a drawer, it's somewhere that you keep stuff. It's a letter, it's an old thing from, your, from college, it's, it's something else. How many of you have a place that you keep stuff, stuff that's valuable to you? Now, the stuff that you keep, if I walked in there and you said, here, I want to give something to you, that, something that means so much to you, I'm like, why are you handing me a snotty Kleenex that's well, you know, that was the first time that he kissed me and it made me cry and so I wiped my tears and, and then my tears were held in this tissue and I wanted to keep it because it meant something to me. Things that you value, you keep it. So even, even when I was writing the sermon, I thought, okay, I got a keep box. So I went up in the attic and I opened it and I started thumbing through this keep box and it was like, I got hooked. I was up there for like 30 minutes. I'm, I was like, what's his name in Christmas vacation? I like got my stuff up. I'm just hanging out in the attic, you know? 
And I'm, I'm looking through all this stuff, and I come across lots of different pictures and lots of different things that mean nothing. I came across this little golf ball um, that Michelle and I's very first date, we went putt-putt golf, and I stole, yes, I stole it, okay? I didn't hit it in the hole at the end. I put it in my pocket. Your pastor stole a golf ball, and I'm not giving it back. I'll send the place 20 bucks if I need to. I kept this ball. This ball means nothing to nobody else, but it means a lot to me. So uh, I came across this jersey. I brought it with me. This is my old college basketball jersey. This thing is like 20 years old. Now, I also have several rings. I have championship rings. I have all-American plaques. I have all these things. I didn't bring any of those because this means more to me. All of the plaques, all the rings are moments. These are a series of memories. You know, I sweat in this. I bled in this. I, I hurt in this. I was in unity with other guys in this jersey, and so this meant a lot to me. Now, if I gift-wrapped this and sent it to you for Christmas and said, hey, I wanted to give you the most meaningful thing in my, my life, here you go, you'd be like, what the crap? Why is he sending me a sweaty, <laughs> nappy, disgusting jersey that smells like mildew and cheese? Like, what is he doing? But it, but it means something to me. Now, let me ask you this. If I kept a sweaty jersey for 20 years, why would I get rid of the love of God. Like if you came to me and said, hey, can I have your jersey? I'm like, no, this, this means too much to me. And if you tried to take this out of my hands, I don't know that I would kill you over it. It's not that big of a deal. But I sure would be like, no, man, you can't, you can't have this jersey. So why would I not be more protective of God's love? Do you, do you know how valuable? So good, God. So good. Do you realize how valuable the love of God is? Without it, we are nothing. Let me, let me show you this passage that tries, even Paul tried his best to illustrate how important the love of God was. In Ephesians 3, 17, he says, and I pray, and he's talking this to the church of Ephesus, but he's also talking to the church of Victory Church in 2020. And he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, because it's going to take power for you to try to comprehend, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, now this word know is really important. It, this word know in this passage is the Greek word ginasko. And it means knowledge gained by experience. Knowing intimately. It's like, you know, the biblical form of know, you know. There's an intimacy. There's something that's so intimate that I experience this love. And this is what Paul is saying, verse 19, and to know, to gnosko, to experience this love that surpasses knowledge. It means you can't understand it, so stop trying to figure it out. Just take it and keep it. Just, underst just, just, just let it soak in to know this love that you may be filled to the measure of of all the fullness of God. The reverse of this will be true, that if you do not accept the love of God, you will never be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Because you cannot live in, live in the fullness of God without living in the fullness of his love. Because God is love. So the first thing we gotta do, we gotta take it. And the second thing we gotta do, we gotta keep it. And the third thing we gotta do is we gotta let it. Let it. Love is very similar to peace. We talked about this with peace. The way peace works is that you let peace, you let the peace of Christ come in, and as it comes in, it transforms your heart, and then peace flows out of you. It's an overflow. You can never live a peaceful life unless you first allow the peace of Christ to come in your heart. And once it invades your heart and takes up every corner of your heart in fullness, remember we talked about perfect peace, shalom, shalom, perfect peace, that when it invades, then, then we, when we let it in, it lets out. Love is the same way. When, when God's love is let into me, then God's love is let out of me. So I got to take it, I got to keep it, and I got to let it. I got to let God's love. Because you, did you know that you can keep God's love from coming in? If you don't accept yourself, you're not going to accept God's love. So I, I let God's love come in. You'll never love yourself until you understand God's love for you. The other part of that is you will never love other people until you understand how much God loves other people. Wow. Yeah. The people that you can't stand who post stuff that's the opposite of what you think, 
God actually loves them as much as he loves you. Deal with it. <laughs> God's love is, the, is, is, that's why racism will never change until we know God's love. We know and experience Gnosko, his love for other people. Political tension and differences will never change until we let the love of God come in our hearts and understand this. So we let God's love in, and then God's love is let out from us. So I want to conclude by just showing you a picture of this in Scripture, okay? For the next few moments, I'm going to go and kind of do some expository teaching. It's called expository teaching, where we take a passage of Scripture, and we just go verse by verse, line by line, and it's like 12 chapters, okay? So settle in. I'm kidding. It's not. It's just a few. But I, I actually do want to challenge you with this passage, okay? So get out a pen, get out a phone. I want you to write this down because I want you to meditate on this passage and read over it for about the next week or two and really digest it during the Christmas season. So if you're getting up in your quiet time and you just kind of one of those people that open the Bible and close your eyes and point, okay, what are you saying, Lord? Um, and they circumcise themselves. No, thank you. Uh, this is a passage of Scripture that I want you to, to meditate on, okay? You ready for it? It's 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 through 21, just right there. And I'm going to go through it right now and unpack some stuff, but it's so rich, I don't have time to unpack it all. And let the Holy Spirit unpack some of it for you. Expository teaching is me saying the Bible teaches, the Bible's a lot better preacher than I am, so I'm going to get out of the way and let the Bible preach for a second, okay? So let's dive into this. The first couple of verses we'll read, then we'll unpack. Verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8 is the one that will slap you in the face. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. If you have the inability to love other people, not the people you like. If you have the inability to love all people, the scripture says, then you don't know God. Gnosko. It doesn't mean you don't, you know, have an affection for God. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say something mean. I'm breaking down the Greek word gnosko. It says you don't know God, which means you've never experienced God's love in its fullest form. Because you know that when you experience God's love in its fullest form, you know that you don't really deserve it. But you still get to experience it. So when I get to receive something that I didn't earn, I don't deserve it, then I'm much more willing to give something to someone else that they don't deserve and that they didn't earn either. That's what the scripture's unpacking for us. So love, this is the key. For us, for Christ followers, loving others is not an optional virtue. It's a distinguishing mark. It is what distinguishes us. Um, You going to the coffee shop and reading your Bible for all to see, that's great, and you should do that, but that's not what distinguishes you as a believer. You having a Victory Church sticker on your car and driving around the city does not distinguish you as a believer, especially if you got your middle finger out the window while you're doing it. That's, that's bad. <laughs> but that, you should do that. We should all get bumper stickers. That's great. I love it. But that's not what distinguishes us. What distinguishes us is our ability to love other people. It, it becomes, I happen to have a jersey on my podium. Loving others becomes your jersey. Now, when I put this jersey on, everybody knows what team I'm on. I'm on this team, and I'm going to score points for this team, and I want this team to win, so I'm going to give everything I got for this team to win. And we come into the kingdom of God, God says, they won't know you by the jersey you have on. And you could go to Mardell and buy all the cute little cheesy Christian t-shirts you want, but that's not how they're going to know you, know that you're one of mine. They're going to know you by your ability to love other people. And Jesus said it this way. Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Verse 35, by this, by what? By your ability to love other people, they will know, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It's not whether I vote red or blue. Oof. Just got super quiet. It's my ability to love red and blue. Not to cower, not to to go against my beliefs. I'm not saying any of those things. But it's my ability to break through the hate of a world, break through the hate, and express love. Grace and truth, 
right? It's not grace with no truth, and it's not truth with no grace. It's the ability to express love in all times, in all situations. First John, let's go to verse 9. i got to hurry. Verse 9. Verse 9 says this. This goes on to say, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. That's, you know, you want to know what love is? What is love, baby, don't hurt me. No. John says, this is love. This is love right here. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete. This word complete, when we talked about this a couple weeks ago, complete is the Greek word plerao, which means coming into full completion. My question is, are we expressing God's plerao, the complete, are we experiencing the plerao of God's love? It's coming into completion. And he's saying no one has ever seen God, but when we let God love us, and we turn and love others, God, people that don't know God, see God through us. Some people, the only church they'll ever walk through is you. <laughs> and the only God they'll ever experience is the God they experience through you. And that's what John's getting to. Verse 13 says this, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. There's another gift, you should take it. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Verse 16, this is what I want to unpack. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. The first step is do you know? Do you truly know the love that God has for you? Gnosko, love. You are experiencing it. And once you come into the expression of knowing Gadasco, his love, then you can rely on it. The problem is many of you can't rely on his love because you don't know it. You haven't fully experienced this plerao of God's love and embraced it and let it seep into every part of your heart, even the parts that you don't want to visit because they're disgusting parts of your heart. Your secret sins, your secret issues, your secret problems. Your, you hate the way you look. You hate the way, this, you hate the way you behave. God's love even needs to penetrate those parts of your heart. That God loves even the despicable parts of you. And then we can begin to rely on it. Like, the only reason I walk up on the stage is because I know that it can hold me. I've experienced it before. I've walked up here before. You've sat down in your seat. You didn't go, wait a minute, can this seat hold me? I don't know about this um, seat. No, you just sat down. What does that mean? You relied on it because you had an understanding you understood, you knew that seat could hold you. I walk on the stage, I rely on it to hold me up because I know. And God's like, I want you to rely on me. Sometimes we rely on everything but God because we don't experience his fullness of his love in every aspect of our life. Verse 16, I gotta keep going. God is love, there it is, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So he's saying, whoever lets love in, will let love out. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear. I wanna, I wanna pause right here for just a second because this is for somebody. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, remember there was a perfect peace? This says that perfect, there's a perfect love that when you find perfect love that only comes from God, it actually drives out fear. It can push it out of the way because fear has to do with punishment. God is not about punishment. He's about redemption. And then the last sentence is really strong. Here's another strong one right for you. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. It doesn't mean that God's love isn't for you. It means that you haven't been made perfect in it. You know, whenever you um, click something to download on your computer and you see that little thing that's waiting for it to fill all the way up, which means it's completely downloaded. It's either a pie or like a bar graph, and it, you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. You're waiting for it to become perfect, complete. The word perfect in this, in this text means to finish, to complete, to add to yet wanting in order to render full. 
So you're waiting for something to become full. So it doesn't mean that you're not a, you're, you're not a, you don't have God's love. You have it. My question for all of us, including myself, is have I allowed God's love to be made perfect in me? According to this, there's a perfection. There is a perfect love that I can experience. And this, this Bible, not John, the Bible says the one who fears is not made perfect in love. So how do I know if I'm experiencing God's perfect love? What am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? And I continually allow God's love to get fear out of me. If, if, if I fear the economy, then I am not in perfect love. If I fear as a parent, if I fear something harmful happening to my kids, it doesn't mean that I don't pull them out of the way if a bus is coming. That's stupid. I'm saying that I'm not living in perfect love if I'm continually, perpetually living in fear and anxiety over something bad happening to my kids. Um, If I fear a virus, am I living in perfect love? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a difference between fearing and being wise. I don't fear buses but I don't step out in front of them either, okay? So don't get me twisted on that. I'm not gonna be afraid of a virus, but I'm gonna be careful. I'm not gonna be an idiot. I'm gonna take care of myself, and I'm gonna take care of those around me, I'll be responsible. So what are we allowing to, to create fear in us? Because the Bible says that perfect love drives out fear. Isn't that beautiful? I want this perfect love. I wanna experience the perfect love that God has for me. Okay, I'll conclude these next three verses. Unpack these this week. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. Read them over and over and over and over and over again. If one word pops out to you, pull it up in another translation. See what it says. Just like dig into it and, and mine out some stuff out of this passage. First John 4, 19. It says, Rich. It says, we love because he first loved us. And whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Whew. He's brutal. Like, this guy's brutal, man. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God maybe should, might want to think about, no, must also love their brother and sister. Well, you you may say, well, who's my brother? Who's my sister? Who is my neighbor? Remember they asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he went on to tell the story of the Samaritan. Remember this? The guy who fell in a ditch and some people went by and somebody went around. But somebody that was the complete opposite had no business dealing with this guy. You talk about racism, this was racism. Stopped. Put him on his donkey. Took him to a plane and gave money and said, whatever he needs. That's love. That's loving your neighbor. And this is what he's talking about. And, the, and this, is, this is harsh. I get this. But this is what this Bible is saying, is if you don't love your brother like that, then you don't know me. It's strong. It's strong. So, and I will say, it's harder to love people now than ever before. Right? (laughs) Because everyone's an expert on everything. Like, you watch a YouTube video, you're now the expert on that subject. Well, I read this article that said... And now everyone's an expert. So it's becoming really hard to love anybody. So more than ever, we get to practice this aspect of loving. And I'll conclude by just saying, listen, my my prayer is that during this Christmas season, um, with all its simplicities, but with all of its complexities, we would all embrace and come to the understanding of how to understand and know that Jesus loves you. And I know it's simple, But if we can embrace that, it will change the way we live. It'll change the way we think. It'll change the way we act in every way of our lives. So this Christmas season, may you realize that Christ has come. He's come. And with him comes hope and peace and joy and love. Christmas. Take it. (laughs) Keep it. (laughs) Let it. Let it. Once again, thank you for joining us today for this week's message at Victory Church, where we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond themselves, and be transformed. The only way that can happen is through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, 
we would like to invite you to partner in giving towards this ministry. You can do that by visiting our website at victory.church give or download our Victory Church app and select give. Once again, thank you. And God desires for us to live life to the full.